Hi, I'm Mike Ward. I want to talk to you about private equity and just to give you a very quick overview of how private equity works. I think it's a very interesting topic in finance. Now, let me start by reading to you a little extract from Gillian Tett. She is a, um, uh, one of the writers for the Financial Times, and in May 2019, she wrote this. She said, when financiers gathered at the Milken Conference last month, a chart was passed around that should make policymakers, voters and investors rethink the nature of modern capitalism. The chart showed that between 2000 and 2018, the number of private equity backed companies in America rose from less than 2000 to nearly 8000. Publicly listed companies in this period, by contrast, fell from 7000 to about 4000. Now, she goes on to note that, well, it's a private equity backed companies only represent about five trillion dollars worth of market cap, whereas the rest of the market public companies is about 30 trillion. Nevertheless, this very fast growth in the field of private equity should make us think. And certainly we would want to understand what what happens. How does this work? Why is it so attractive? And that's what I would like to talk about now. Private equity is not only about leverage, but it is uh, that is always a component of how private equity companies work. So I thought it would be a good idea just to start by talking about the fact that uh, this we should be very careful about leverage. It always leads to problems. Too much leverage is the cause of almost all bankruptcies. And uh, so I've, I've got a little checklist here that I think is worth talking about. And uh, we, when we talk about private equity, let's be clear here, we are not talking venture capital startups and that type of uh, business. Almost always private equity deals are on seasoned companies which have been around for a while, mature in many ways. So here's, here's my checklist. How cyclical is the industry? Cyclicality, like seasonality, and these are different things, are is is a risk contributor. And uh, so if it's already a cyclical industry, like shipping, for example, or vehicle manufacturing, highly cyclical industries, we, we want to be wary about doing private equity deals. Secondly, is it capital intensive? If we've got a lot of fixed cost because of the high investment in capital in assets so again shipping for example is also capital intensive ship building i'm talking about here and uh, so is vehicle making Th those in this, not everything that is cyclical is also capital intensive but if you combine those two things it adds a level of risk that that is inherent in the industry we also want to ask questions about the technology of the business. Is, is, is there risk involved in technology? Some technology is less risky than others. And so, again, we, we're looking for inherent risk. So the first three things are really no things. We don't want cyclicality. We don't want capital intense in, in industries. We don't want risky technology because those things carry risk. Then the next five things I'm going to mention are things we do want when we are looking for or thinking about leveraging up businesses. We want, we want margin, profit margin. These must be also strong, protected margins. We don't want it to be a commodity type business where it's very easy to come in uh, if the margins are there at the moment, but could go. That's why I'm putting the word protected in there. Um, we would like strong margin businesses not commodity businesses. We would like a track record of strong cash flows. We're not interested if there isn't a long track record. We want to be sure because we're putting leverage, we've got to repay the debt. We also would like to know what the assets are like. Hopefully the, you know, if things go wrong, let's put it that way, it would be nice to be able to fall back on the quality of the assets. And uh, we're hoping that's not going to be necessary, but it's there. We would like competent management who understand and know the business. That's not a prerequisite because many private equity companies will bring in their own management team. In fact, they prefer to do that. Uh, and then we're going to spend quite a lot of time thinking about 
uh, in the form of, of private equity at least, how do we get out of this? Private equity is not in this for the long term. They are looking to restructure and fix businesses, as I'll explain for the moment. So this is my quick checklist. Uh, checklist. And uh, it's worth thinking through these things, I think, for any particular acquisition or target that we're looking at. So let's talk about how the private, these private equity companies actually work. Now, the key, the central party in a private equity type uh, deal are what we call the general partners or the managing partners. Now these are a group of investment bankers, they usually start off in that way, uh, for example, who are well known, who've got good reputations individually, and they get together and they form a general partnership. But their problem is that they themselves don't, don't really have capital. They have maybe some money, but not nothing that they're really looking for. So but they've got skill and they have got track records and they are known. And uh, so they go and look for money. And obviously the place to look for money are pension funds, uh, large institutions. And we refer to these parties in the private equity context as being the limited par uh, partners, as you, as you will see. They have got very limited powers in all of this. Their main job is to provide the money. And uh, now, of course, in institutions, pension funds and so on tend uh, not to put a lot of money into private equity. Most of their capital is invested in equities, listed equities and properties and bonds and other kind of more traditional assets. But a small portion of their capital is going to go into kind of special investments of which private equity funds is a very big growing part. And many of these pension funds are huge. So, you know, a few billion dollars can, you know, can be can go quite far. And uh, so what happens is that the general partners come along and they say, we would like to raise uh, some money. Let's call it fund number one. And we're looking for X million. Later on, it'll be billions. But to begin with, they're going to have to start small and uh, they're going to go and approach institutions. Sometimes they will have uh, other people helping them do this. And uh, they're going to the, the basic deal is going to be, please, uh, can we have some money which we want to put in our fund and we are going to take your money and we will invest it in companies. And we, you have no, you must just send the money when we ask for it. Uh, we might pay a small fee for you just to keep it, you know, hot in case we ask for it. Um, but we'll tell you when we want it and you must send it. You must leave full discretion to us as to how we're going to invest it. And we're not telling you when we're going to give it back to you. You cannot tell us that you want it back. In fact, it's entirely in our hands. And we're going to try and give you a certain return. Let's agree that we will try to give you, and I'm just making up a number here, 8%. If we can't, though, sorry, for, for, sorry about that. But we'll try. If we give you more than 8%, well, then we would like to get a cut of anything that's above the 8%. So that's the general story. Now, you, you will ask, why would anybody want to do this? Well, the thing is that these, um, these general partners have got certain skills and the system works pretty well and the history has been pretty good. So the idea is they're going to go having raised some money into their first fund and look for target companies that they want to buy. So these will be... Um, companies, some of them may be listed, some are already unlisted, but they're going to delist these companies if they're listed, and they're going to put a lot of debt into them, uh, because debt is cheaper than equity, they get tax benefits out of debt, and also it gears up the investor's return. So that's why we looked at the leveraging uh, issues, questions, criteria up front. We want to put a lot of debt in, We'll get that, that debt largely from banks, commercial banks, and but banks even have their own limits. And so there are times when the fund itself will put in debt. That'll be subordinated debt. It won't uh, carry the same quality of asset cover or probably none. And uh, on top of that, the fund is going to also put in equity. But it's we prefer to have debt because if we can get the tax advantages on debt, let's do that. So once we've done that, uh, we're going to try and uh, bu build up a number of target companies and, 
uh, sorry, I forgot to mention, and this is actually a key issue here, the general partners will also put in a little bit of money. Now, for each partner, uh, they are going to have to know every time they sit down and look at one of these deals. And they look at many deals, by the way, before they'll engage in one. So they may take three, four deals for every hundred that they investigate. Uh, each partner knows that when they sit down and evaluate, should we put money into this target, that they themselves are going to have to put in some money personally. And uh, whilst it may be immaterial in terms of the bigger scheme of things, for each of them, there's some materiality. They know they could lose this as well. And uh, so this is part of the what we call skin in the game concept that makes private equity work so well. Uh, in addition, the management team of this uh, target company here will also be encouraged to invest in their own company, but given some shares uh, as, as part of the deal to give them skin in the game as well. And if we don't like the existing management team, well, then we're going to bring in our own. We'll do a management buy-in. And uh, often the general partners have, have, you know, got contacts they know people and uh, they want to use their own people. And so that's part of the deal. Now, uh, they're going to take on several targets of the first one, second one, third one. They're going to use up all the money in the funds and uh, they will be um, be trying to fix these these companies, improve these companies. And I'll explain how they're going to do that. And a lot of talk once the money has been invested into the fund will be about the exit. How do we get out of these target companies? We're not in this for the long term, as I mentioned. And right up front, they'll be thinking about how they plan to exit the deal. And whilst that's taking place, they'll be raising fund number two. And you'll notice this is twice as big. And then fund number three and number four and so on. And the fund sizes will grow based on their track record. And over time, they hope to become one of the big players in private equity. So let's talk a little bit then uh, about the way in which they create value through private equity, this mechanism we've been talking about. So ideally, they want to buy companies very cheaply. So I'm just giving you an example here. Here's a company with uh, EBIT operating profits of 40 million. They want to buy it on a four times multiple, an EBIT multiple of four. That's very low. And uh, so they, they're going to pay, if they can get it, 160 million for this company that they've identified. One of a hundred that they've looked at where this might be possible. And uh, they're going to structure the capital in this with a lot of debt. So I'm just assuming some numbers here. 100 million will be debt and 60 million will be what the, what the fund puts in in the form of equity. Preferably all of that debt will come from commercial banks. Then over the next few months, maybe years, uh, they're going to try and sell this company for uh, with the, they'll improve the profit margin and uh, they want the, the operating profit to double. And they also want the quality of the earnings to improve. So they're looking to, to kind of try and have more steady earnings, cleaner earnings, faster growing earnings, all of the things that will help the company improve its multiple. And that's going to take the company up to 480 million in terms of its value. And by the time they do this, they're hoping that the debt will be completely repaid. And so the equity has gone from 60 million to 480 million in terms of value. All the surplus cash flow has been used to, to repay the debt. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit here. They would like to reduce the debt, let's rather say. So if you unpack the steps that they're taking, and here you can see in my little graphic here that the equity is going from 40, uh, or in this case, sorry, 60 to 480. So I'm just kind of showing you that. That's the return. And how have they done this? Well, first of all, they've grown the operating profits. Secondly, they've repaid the debt. Thirdly, they have managed to improve the multiple that they're using to value the company. They're hoping it's going to be growing faster and it's worth more. And finally, they want to do this fast. That's why they focus on the exit. The quicker you can turn around this company, clean it up, fix it and sell it, uh, the better. So they'll be talking a lot about the exit. How do we get out of this company? 
right up front. Are we going to list it, sell it to a trade buyer or whatever? And uh, so because these companies tend to be fairly highly leveraged, they'll be talking a lot about the debt service coverage ratio. Now, you will be familiar of interest cover ratio, which is taking the operating profit. Normally, we just take the operating profit, EBIT, and divide it by interest. And, you know, banks are happy with numbers of around six or seven. We find that those are comfortable numbers for companies. If you want to be triple A rated in terms of your company, though, you, that's going to be twice as high as that, 12 times, maybe 20 times. But the private equity companies are putting a lot of emphasis on gearing. And so they use a much more accurate measure. We call this the debt service coverage ratio. In essence, instead of putting operating profits on the numerator of the equation, they put free cash flow. Now, you will know free cash flow is actual cash flows, not profits. So it includes things like depreciation and amortization as part of the cash flow. And it also includes the interest on the tax shield. And they divide that not just by the interest that has to be paid each year, but if there's capital which has to be repaid as well in terms, you know, on the, any long-term debt, that must also be included in the denominator. And they're looking for numbers kind of much lower. So you can see here, I'm just saying this should be about at least 1.1. That's very low. Uh, and it must, yeah, they must be pretty certain it's going to improve. So in the years ahead, that's why the, the emphasis on strong cash flows is so important. Robust, strong, committed, mature businesses which produce cash flows is really what's going to make this work. And uh, so I'm also just noticing here that, you know, banks typically going to set the repayment terms of this debt. And they're going to make sure that they are repaid before any quasi um, equity the debt that's been put in by the private equity company. So let's talk about what they call the 2%, 8%, 20% rule and carried interest, which are terms you'll hear about. Now, first of all, it's not really a rule, and there's been a lot of pressure on the so-called rule, but if you could make this rule, you would as well. The 2% relates to the management fee that the private equity company, the management partners, if you like, the managing partners want to, to charge the uh, fund for, for doing the work. They feel they should get 2% of um, a 2% fee that will be on the investment that's in the fund for running looking after these companies they themselves by the way are not actually going to actually run these companies they, they will sit on the board they will make all the big decisions or veto them or control them but they want uh, and they will they will have operating managers doing the the day-to-day -day work uh, their role will be rather to think strategically about acquisitions and uh, getting cheaper equity and bringing the expertise as bankers to, to the party. Uh, and they feel they should get a 2% fee for that. Then in addition to that, once the target return of 8% is achieved, the general partner feels that they should get a disproportionate share and that's where the 20% comes in. And uh, so once we've given you your 8%, we want 20% of anything that's made above that. And then also there will be various other charges, such as raising fees, and if they can, they will find other ways of charging fees. So this has been one of the big criticisms of private equity. Now, let me just demonstrate how this might work. So sometimes this is just referred to as the distribution waterfall. And so let's say we find a company which costs $100, and uh, that's the investment that is made from the fund. So once we have uh, fix the company, we're going to sell it for, let's say, $200. We've made a $100 profit. Well, how does that play out? Who gets it? Well, first of all, obviously, we have to repay the $100 we invested back to the fund. And so the first $100 must go there. Then we have to give them 8% of the investment because that was what we agreed. So they get the 8. And then finally, we split the balance of the profits uh, we, we want 20%. So that's almost $20. We, it's not quite 20, but I've just represented it as 20. And the rest, uh, $72, goes to the fund. So you can see that's still a pretty good return to the fund. They're getting $80, 80, $80 in total. And uh, if you include the $100 that they put in, uh, you know, they get $180 back. 
and the private equity partners get $20. But that's a fabulous return on capital that they never invested. They didn't put any capital into this deal, or basically negligible fact, uh, capital. And so they're, they're able to get significant returns on the capital, the, the, the amount that this, this whole deal was worth. So it's very lucrative to them. But it's lucrative to everybody if it works out like this. Sometimes they don't work out. Now let's go and just have a look at some of the stuff that's been happening recently around the world here. And you can see here in this chart from the Financial Times about three years ago, you can see some of the big private equity contributors. And you'll see things like the California uh, CalPERS Fund in North America. The US has got really the biggest contributors really in terms of uh, experienced um, institutions who are keen to invest money into private equity. But you can see also in the Middle East, Abu Dhabi is uh, keen to do this kind of things. And in other parts of the world in, in, the U in Europe where they're struggling to get returns are also looking at uh, this uh, private equity as a, as a place to invest. And then you can also see the largest uh, private equity funds, Apollo, Blackstone, some of these I'm sure you have heard of. So if we look as well, what's been happening, and you can see this is re recent cutting from the Financial Times in March 2020, you will see that there was a lot, there were a lot of deals being do done, especially in the Americas in up until 2008. And uh, lesser so in Europe, Europe is still getting more used to the idea and in other parts of the world at the bottom there you can see and then for quite a while there was there wasn't much happening in the private equity world uh, people were worried about gearing and the crash after the great global financial crisis and what was happening with interest rates and so on and then we start to see more and more deals and initially in the US again and uh, Heinz you may remember that deal um, the Brazilian company 3G uh, did that one uh, after Kraft, and then they tried to do Unilever, which, which with Warren Buffett, in fact, he was part of this, uh, and so on. And you can see that in the States, it's been back on track. And uh, you can see, if you look in uh, Europe, you can see um, a few fewer deals, and recently, Taste and Krupp, just the elevators, um, quite a controversial deal, actually, just being done, uh, $18 billion or thereabouts. And then in, in Asia, we can see a couple of deals here. This is um, Toshiba memory, and uh, that was, has been talked about. So it's, we, there were a, quite a few deals taking place before the COVID issues. Uh, if we have a look at the top 10, you can see a little bit more detail just uh, in terms of what's been happening in Europe uh, recently. If we look at the returns that private equity companies have had, and they, they, they're not so transparent on this, not easy to get really good data about this. Uh, but you can see some very impressive returns here um, uh, over quite a, a long period of time here um, taking place. This data is a little bit dated. There's, there's quite a lot of research which has looked into private equity and basically the, 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 the research all tends to say the same thing. It really does work on average, uh, and it's a you get you do get pretty good returns from all of this. And um, the the way in which it works, using leverage and fixing companies, is actually very efficient and effective. And uh, their their quick turnarounds also uh, really do enhance investors' returns. And that's what's attracting the money into into private equity. The skin in the game concept, where where the uh, every player has got something to win and to lose in this uh, makes it really work pretty well. So you can see uh, again, 18th of March, this particular shot here is showing that what's happened over time. In the top chart, you can see that the leverage has been growing. And uh, they're talking about um, the, this is greater than seven times EBIT uh, it put, is put into debt in, in the, um, the, in the funding structure of all of these deals. And so that's that's a lot of debt going into uh, the deal. And then you'll also notice that there's been an increasing amount of, um, of dry powder, we call this, the cash pile that has been, been put into private equities where they've been looking for deals. 
uh, uncalled capital. And um, so th th what's happened at the moment is that there's a lot of dry powder looking for deals as COVID hits us. And uh, I think we're going to see, and you can see here recently, April 2020, private equity sets its sights on state bailouts. There are a lot of opportunities right now for private equity to get involved in restructuring, turning around companies which have been hit badly by COVID-19. And let's face it, these guys are good at what they do. And uh, whilst they are certainly not going to take on everything, they, they will be very careful about what they do take on. It is a good time to invest. Prices are going to be cheap uh, to get into many of these companies. So.